Good afternoon, and welcome to K2's Road to Excellence with Excel Series Part 19 in our partner tax cycle. This is Alan Salmon, and I'm so pleased that you're joining me today for this informative session. A bit of news, Marilyn Benninger, who is normally my backup, is not with us today. She is in Calgary doing the Calgary edition of my 2018 accounting technology seminar. And Casey Sims from our U.S. office is supposed to be with us, but I don't see her yet. So my backup for the starting point is going to be Elizabeth from Tax Cycle. A couple of admin things. Your microphones are muted for obvious reasons. You're welcome to take notes. However, be aware that within 10 days of today's webinar, you'll get a package of material. That, that will include a recording of this webinar, my extensive teaching notes, my teaching files that I use today, and the answers to the questions. And, of course, your CPD certificate. When it comes to questions, you ask those through the chat window. And at the end of the webinar, we will collect all of the questions, send them to Elizabeth and myself. We will answer our questions. And in your package, you will get all of the questions and all of the answers. Now, when it comes to CPD certificates, four times today, we're going to get stopped and a polling question will be put up. And if you haven't been with us before, the polling question is a multiple choice question, usually four answers. And you don't have to get the correct answer. All you have to do is click on one of them and click on submit. And that time stamps your record. And if you're recorded as answering three, at least three of the four questions, you will get a CPD certificate for one hour of verifiable credits. If you don't, it'll be one hour of non-verifiable. Now today's topic, I'm going to, in today's topic or session, I am going to deal with the multiplicity of ways that you can get data into Excel and get it organized. And so the first polling question will deal with what version of Excel are you using? And Elizabeth, can you please put that up? Okay, what percentage do you have, Elizabeth? 90% voted. Okay, let's close it and see the results, please. Okay, I will be teaching today in Excel 2016, really the Office 365. There will be a couple of times when what I'm doing, those of you on 2013 and 2010 will have to download an add-on to do what I'm doing. And for those of you on Office 2007, you won't be able to do those couple of things. Office 2007 is now 11 years old. Uh, and quite frankly, I forget everything I ever knew about 2010, but you'll be able to do 90% of what I'm going to do. So Elizabeth, please close the poll. And you're looking at a blank spreadsheet. And as I said, there are a multiplicity of ways of bringing data in, and we're gonna cover about four, four or five of them. But before I start, I wanna call up this file here. And that is text to columns. Now, why am I calling that up? Because particularly those of you on 2013, 2010, 2007, when you bring in certain types of files, and I'll get to those, you are going to have to use text to columns to clean it up. So notice, and I put the, the break in this row because there's actually about 5,000 rows here. Let's look at this data, and it's the general. Let's look at this data, and it's general, but it's got 
this little thingy here. When I click on it, it says number stored as text. Do I want to convert it to a number or do I want to ignore it? Well, for now, I'm going to ignore it and I'm going to go here. And I'm going to go to the data tab and I'm going to go to text to columns. Now, I suspect that many of you in the past have used text to columns to break up things like first name and last name, uh, break up city, uh, province, and postal code, and so on. I'm going to show you a different spin on that. So, yes, the data is delimited. Yes, the delimiter is a tab. But watch the next screen, which we usually bypass. Column data format. We want it to be general. So when I click on finish, notice the type. And now I can do standard math. So that's an introduction because, as I said, in some of the things I'm going to do with you and for you today, you're going to need text to columns. So next, I want to deal with a particular type of file that we get all the time. And if you look at Explorer here, I've got a file called customer list CSV. Dot CSV. So that is in the CSV format when I open it. And many, many, many times when you're downloading data from an accounting program or a database or the web, it'll come down as a CSV file. So let's open up this file. And there we go. Now, at first blush, it looks like any other Excel file. I don't know how much data we've got. No, not much, because I don't need much. So the obvious question is, what's the difference between an Excel file and a CSV file? Well, the CSV stands for Commerce Separated Value, and it's been around since, I don't know, the early 80s. And it's a standard way of getting data out of certain sources. And it only has one advantage over an Excel file. And I don't think any of you will ever take advantage of it, but I may be misjudging you. In Excel, I can only have 1 million and I think 28,000 rows. In a CSV file, it's unlimited. Now, what's the downside to a CSV file? There are a lot. There are formatting issues, there are complex formulas, there are uh, format as table that you can't do to a CSV file. So conventional wisdom says, when I get this, I'm going to do a file, save as, and instead of saving it as a comma delimited, I'm going to save it as an Excel workbook, and I'm not going to do that. You don't need me to do that. So that's dealing with CSV files, which are a particular type of text files. So now let's move on to here. And that is a true text file. And as I said, the rows are unlimited. And it looks like it's broken up into five columns. But it really isn't. It's actually in one row, and it's broken up by a tab here, 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 and here, and so on. So how do I get that into Excel? Well, let's start here with a blank, and I'm going to go to the data tab, and here's where the first difference will be. I'm going to go from text to CS to or a CSV file. And you will have a similar command in 2010 and 2007, and you'll click on that. So I clicked on it. And now it wants to know where that CSV file is. So we're going to go to my desktop and here. And I've got two of them customer list we've already seen, 
but I've got a text file here that's tab delimited, and I'm going to op import it. And you notice the way the data is formed here with the apostrophes breaking the rows up? Well, that's symbi symbiotic or otic of a text file. There we go. Now, here's the difference. In Excel 2016, my screen looks like this. In 2013, 2010, if you don't have the Power Query add-on, you, your file will look like the one that I used text to columns and you'll use text to columns. But in 2016, I'm now using a tool called Power Query. And if I look down at the bottom, load, I'm going to click on it. Gee, that's impressive. It automatically loaded the text file. It automatically converted it into, tab into a table. And all I need to do now is save it as an Excel file. Back to those of you on the other versions. It will come in, but the formatting, the table format, won't be here. That's the only difference. I'm going to do this again as an intro to something that's going to happen early next year. So I'm going to go to the data tab from text. And I'm going to do the import. Same thing. But down here, instead of loading, I'm going to go to transform data. Now, why am I going there? Because I've now opened the Power Query Editor. And, and it's, it's automatically there in 2016. Those of you on 13 and 10 can download it. There's no charge for it. And in the Query Editor, and a query is nothing more than a question, I can now modify this data set before I bring it in. So I can select columns, I can remove columns, I can keep rows, de da de da de da So I can massage it. Now, you can't learn Power Query in half an hour or five minutes for me, but early in the new year in one of our 2019 mini webinars, my partner, Ward Blatch, who is a query guru, will do a half hour exclusively on Power Query. So if I had made changes here, then I go over here to close and load and watch what happens. Same thing. Let's move to a different type of data. And that is, there will be times when some of you will need to import data from an access database. And I'm going to show you two ways of doing that. The first is, I'm going to go again to the data tab, I'm going to go to get data from a database, from a Microsoft Access database. And gee, I have two of them here, Northwind and Extreme. And for this example, I'm going to use Northwind. So I select it and I go to import. Okay. Now, for those of you on 13, 10, and 7, your screen, you will have the, the selections that are here, which are the tables within the database, but your screen will look a little bit different. This one's much cleaner. All right, so what data do I want to bring in? Here it is. I want some sales and analysis data. So I've clicked on it, and in the preview window, is a look at what the data is going to look like. So we're going to have order ID, order date, employee, customer name, product name, and so on. And again, I could transform the data, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to load 
and you will do the same thing in the other versions. And it's getting my data, and there we go. Now, in the other versions, again, you won't get the table, but you'll get all the columns. Now, this is a look at one table, and many times we need to use more than one table. So how do we do that? Well, we start off the same way on the data tab, and we get data. But this time, I'm going to other sources and from Microsoft Query. And I get this little window. I want an access database. Now I got to go find it. So we're going to go to Users Allen. We're going to go down here to the desktop. And there we go. This time, I'm going to select the X or the Extreme database, and I'm going to click on OK. Now, this is the old uh, way, and this is the way all of your screens are going to look. And what we have here are a list of tables. And I'm going to go down to the customer table and look at the plus sign. When I click on that, there are the columns in the table or the fields to use the technical name. And I only want one. I want the customer name, so I'm going to move it over. Close customer. Go down to orders. I want the order date. and close that, and the order detail. And I want product, unit price, and quantity. Click on Next, and I don't want to do any filtering. Click on Next, I don't want to do any sorting. I do that in Excel. Click on Next, and I have two choices here. Return the data to Excel or view the data and edit it within Microsoft Query. Well, we're not going there, so we'll click on Finish. Now, for those of you on 2010 and 2007, your only choice is going to be a table and where you want to put it. I could turn this into a pivot table or a pivot chart. I'm not going to. There we go. Now, we could get a lot more complex in terms of using multiplicity of tables and getting into how to connect them and so on, but that's a topic for next year. So the final set of things I want to do with you is this, and that is how do we consolidate data when we get it into Excel? And there are a lot of ways of doing this. So let's see what we've got here. We've got the retail division, we've got the industrial division, and we've got the OEM division. And the data sets are identical. So they all have that. And I want to consolidate them. So there are a number of ways of doing that. We could use the click, click, plus approach. We could use the technique of using equal sum that I showed you a number of months ago. Or we could go to the data tab and use consolidate. So all we're going to do here is tell Excel that we want to do a sum and where the data is. So I go in here and I go to the retail division and I already have the top row and the column A there, so I don't need to do use any of those checkboxes. I just need to highlight the data. I'm going to add it. Industrial division, I'm going to add it. 
OEM division, I'm going to edit. And if your eyesight is really good, the parameters are B9 to F13 in all three cases, and we click on OK, and we get that. All right, let's check A. 250, 275, five and a quarter, five and a quarter, 1050. And that looks awesome until we look at when I select the cell. Some of B10 to B12, no reference back to the other three worksheets. And if we look down the left-hand column, there isn't a 10 to 12, but what there is beside the revenue is a plus sign. So understand what happens. It's a two-part process. The first thing Excel says, well, I've got three divisions. I better add three rows. And then I better bring in B9 from the industrial division, B9 from the OEM division, and so on. And then adding it up makes sense. And whether you show that or not depends on the mood you're in. Okay, now there's another way of doing this when the data is not quite the same. So let me quickly call that up. At this time, I don't have the column headings and I don't have the row headings and I have this situation. Retail division, yep. Industrial division, exactly the same, but look at the OEM division. There, I only have the third quarter and the fourth quarter. So that begs the question, can we still do the consolidate? My answer to that is watch me. So I go here and notice that I don't have anything here. Still doesn't, it doesn't prevent me from doing the consolidate. So we'll go there. This time I need the top row and I need the left column and I do exactly the same thing. I go to the retail division, but this time I highlight the column headers and the row names. Add, add, just highlighting this, and add. So I wonder what's gonna happen when we click on okay. Now let's understand what happened. In here, it added 250 and 275, and it ignored quarters one and quarter two in the OEM division. Quarters three and four, it added all three of those. Now there's a limit to how much uh, it'll consolidate properly, but in most cases, data consolidate is a great way to pull stuff together. And I have just in time to wow you with what I wanna do here. If I go back to my Explorer and go here, I have a folder called CSV120 that consists of 10 folders as a subfolder, and that's the years 2008 to 2017. And if I open up any of these years, I have 12 CSV files. And if I open up any of the CSV files, I have this situation. I have ledger data normally running about 16 or 17 rows. So here's the challenge. I've got 120 files, and I want to bring them into one worksheet. Will it take me an hour to do it? I once did this in two minutes and 20 seconds. So Elizabeth, do me a favor. When I say start, will you time me, please? Sure. I'll get out my timer. All right. Let's go. 
So I've clicked on data, and I'm going to get data from a file, but I want it from a folder. So we need the path. And there's the folder. And it shows me the 10 years. And I click on OK. And again, I'm in Power Query. So there is the link. Click on OK. And it shows me the 120 files. Well, that's interesting. Combine. But I don't only, not only want to combine, I want to combine and load. So I click. And now it's showing me a view of the data as it is in each of the 120 files. Click on OK. And it's going to turn away for here on here for about 10 seconds. Whoops, stop, Elizabeth. Stop. How long? Uh, one minute and 12 seconds. That's the best I've ever done this. Now to prove this to you, Let's see how many rows of data that we've got. So if you do the math roughly, you've got 10 years of data times 12 months times roughly 16 or 17 rows. That comes out to about 1811. So I wish I could uh, get you to put your hands up and say, are you impressed? Now. When Wardblatch does his uh, Power Query stuff, he will give you more information on how to do this. And as I said, this can be done in Excel 2016, as I just did, or in 2013 and 2010, if we do the if you download the Power Query. So Elizabeth, I'm done. Can you put up my final poll, please? I will. Here you go. Now, this is a lead in to the next mini webinar in two weeks that I will not be doing. First time in two years. My port partner, Wordblatch, will be showing you an impressive tool called Microsoft's BI Desktop. So let's count down, Elizabeth. Five, four, three, two, one. Close, let's close the poll. The poll. Well, that's impressive, 31%, 9%, obviously half wood, and none of the above. So it's time to do the handoff, and I get a rest. So, Elizabeth, uh, let's give you control. Thank you, Alan. Let's take a minute to swap over here. Let's start with um, the PowerPoint a little bit, just to introduce. So thank you, Alan, and well, thank you, Marilyn, who's not here for having us today. Um, we come in in the spring and the fall and like to talk a little bit about tax cycle after Alan talks about Excel. It's a great way to, to introduce uh, our software and some of the time-saving features we have. When I've done this webinar in the past, and I think I've done this for four times now, maybe at least three, maybe four, I've talked about tax cycle and Excel and how they relate. And this time I thought I would take a little bit of a different tact and go a bit back to basics, uh, partly because it's the fall um, and we're leading into tax season in the new year. And there's some common questions that tax cycle has been around for about well, the company was started in 2010. So we've been around for a while. Some of the things that we take it for granted because we see them every day here in the office, which other people maybe have never seen in action in one of our webinars. So that's why I settled on time-saving tax cycle features for today. And to give you an introduction to who I am and who we are here at Tax Cycle, um, my name is Elizabeth Cole and I'm Director of Communications and User Experience. And if you're a Tax Cycle user, you know that I write a bunch of the documentation and do a, a lot of webinars for us as well. This is our team taken just a few weeks ago in our office here in Calgary. 
Um, our company was founded by Cameron Peters, and if you know that name, you know it because he started Cantax and created Profile back in the day. And Cameron is still heavily involved in the software development here. He actually was finishing a feature, which I'll show today, just yesterday for me. Uh, we are based in Calgary, and we love tax software. That's what we do. We're all experienced. We've worked with other software in the past. And we also love working with you, accountants and tax preparers, to create the best software we can. So when you call us up or an email with suggestions, we work really hard to bring those suggestions into our product. And just to give those of you who may be not doing tax preparation right now, just to let you know what tax cycle is, it's a full suite of tax preparation products for um, the Canadian market. It includes provincial returns for Quebec. It's in one interface um, and it's modern. We've been around, as I said, uh, you can do returns back to 2012 in the T1 module in particular. If you haven't tried it, we have a free trial and you can try all the things I'm going to show you today, except the one that's coming out in the release in November. And I'll point that one out to you if you go to our website and try now. So I'm going to be aggressive, a half an hour to do 12 time-saving tax cycle features. I always like a bit of a gimmick for my webinars. Um, and we're going to try and get through this list. It sounds really big, but it's actually really fast and should give you a bit of an intro of what makes us different. So I'm going to skip out of here and get into the product. As you saw before, this is the tax cycle start screen. And something to note today is that two things. I'm running a development version, which means I'm running something that's not out there in the wild yet. Um, but our, we did a major release earlier this week, and then we'll be doing another one for the latest T2 update in early November. So watch for anything you see here today in that T2 update. The other thing I want to note before I start demoing um, is just that I'm running on a, a screen that is increased. So I, I magnify my screen to make it easy for those of you on smaller screens to see what I'm doing. There's lots of flexibility with Tax Cycle to, to work on a small screen, but also to work on a very large one and have multiple windows. So you might see me try a few things that look a bit funky on a small screen, but work a little bit better on a large screen. And just bear that in mind when you're trying things out. Try it out on your desktop and the way you work. So with Tax Cycle, it is one program that contains all the tax modules you need. So you only install one program. So we have T1, T2, T3, so that's um, and slips for returns. So you're looking at personal tax and corporate tax and, and trust tax and so on. When you get to the start screen to access those different tax modules, you click on one of these colorful icons, and then you can see the options available to you related to that module. Today, I'm mostly going to focus on the T1, TP1 module. And currently, uh, we have a preview of the 2018 tax return, uh, personal tax returns in there. That's why you see this nice green preview slash across the screen. And what this means when something's in preview is that we're still in the midst of um, getting the changes from the CRA, implementing those changes, and being certified for those changes to the forms and calculations. So we put our preview module out so that you can try them out, that you can do some planning with it. Um, but really, those are finalized um, near the end of the year or in the new year based on um, mostly on the timing from the CRA. So be aware of that. So the first thing you need to do when you prepare a tax return from tax cycle, just like Alan was talking about using data from other sources, really, if you're starting with tax cycle, whether you used it last year or you're coming from um, a different software package, you want to be able to use as much as that data as you can. You don't want to be stuck at re-entering data. And so that's what we call carrying forward a return. And you will see here under the 2018 personal tax returns, quite a few options for carrying forward a return. Now, your first option and the most, uh, the most simple one is to click this carry forward button. And this is where you will browse for a tax return that's from the prior year, select it, and then open it. We'll do that in a minute. I'm going to do something slightly different, though. The top one is carry forward and link. And this does something that's unique to tax cycle. So outside of tax cycle, we have another program called doc cycle. And you'll see it, it is included in the complete suite if you buy that package and in a few other 
um, items as well. And what DocCycle lets you do is create a PDF archive of all the source documents your clients bring in. So they can bring in and you can scan them with your scanner or you can drag and drop them from an email or however it works and it will organize them into uh, the taxpayer's name and it will extract some data for import into TaxCycle. So one of the things we like to do is encourage people to use DocCycle and if you're interested in trying it, the easiest thing to do is to carry forward and link and create the DocCycle file at the same time. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to click carry forward and link and then I'm going to click, this is actually a profile file. We can carry forward files from Intuit Profile, from Tax Prep, from CanTax, uh, from Visual Tax, and from Dr. Tax DT Max product. Um, the process is slightly different for DT Max, it's a different data source. But you have some options if you're coming forward. I'll just show you how quick and easy this is. So I'm going to open that file. It's going to create the tax cycle file. And then behind the scenes, it's creating that related doc cycle file. And that's going to come up here. And this doc cycle file is the starting point for where you can just drag and drop or scan in the information um, that your clients bring in the door. The beauty about doc cycle is when you're all finished, you have this file that you can hand back to your clients. It is a standard PDF format, or it's a file that you keep, um, not in a filing cabinet, in, in your virtual filing cabinet. And so if CRA asks you for more information, it's easy for you to go and get it. But I'm going to focus more on the tax cycle side of things here. Um, and I think it would be a good time to take a quick poll. And I'm going to launch my own polls today. What an adventure this is. Um, I usually have John in the background when we do webinars. And my first poll here is what tax cycle, what tax cycle, what tax software are you currently using in your practice? Let us know what you're using. And um, we got 71% voted, 80%. I'll get, let it get up to 90 before I close the poll. And remember, as Alan said, the polls let you record your attendance so your PD credits will get um, ver be verifiable. They were at 87. Anybody more coming in? All right, we're going to close the poll and quickly look at the results. So there we are, we've got 54% of you who aren't using tax software at all. And we've got some tax cycle people in the room too. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be some new stuff for you as well or a reminder and refresher about how um, you can learn a couple of things today. All right, I'm gonna hide the poll and get back to the, the conversation here. So this is a file that was carried forward from profile and you can see any information that was carried forward appears in purple. And usually, sometimes when we carry forward from a software other than TaxCycle, we add a few conversion memos as well. And you'll get a banner up here reminding you of this if you do that. So I can hit conversion memos and it says a few things um, about what happened to the data um, upon carry forward. So in this case, it's some summary data that they want you to review because we're not able to extract it in exactly the format that we need it. Something to note if you're carrying forward from other software. All right, I'm going to not save this right now, and, and we're going to come back here. What we hear from preparers um, is that some people prefer to carry forward all their returns at once. And of course, we can do batch carry forward and tax cycle. And how we do this is using the included client manager. So when you set up uh, tax cycle, you can set up a database, and it will go onto your hard drive or on your server and take a look at all the tax files you currently have not just tax cycle files. It'll go and take a look for profile and tax prep and can tax files as well. So if you're converting to tax cycle, it's a quick way to get all your a list of all your files in here. So this is what I'm going to do is I've got a few profile files and tax cycle files on my hard drive. I'm going to run a quick query and find all of those that were from 2017 and from TP1 and it will build that query and show me the results. So here I have this list of files. I'm going to clear my batch files there. Right now I have 74 files sitting on my hard drive. Now I'm going to do one more thing because I work mostly in tax cycle. Most of those are tax cycle files, but I'm actually going to choose non-tax cycle files only and that'll give me a list of my profile files. Now if I want to carry these all forward at once, it's simple. I just click that, that first column, the top column, 
sorry, the, in the title, the box in the title of the first column, and it lets me select those items for batch. You'll notice that as soon as I did that, the batch items box lit up on screen. And um, I don't have to go straight to processing this batch yet. If I want to go back here and actually pick a tax cycle file and add it in, well, let's just pick any of them. I can do that as well. And then I now have seven items in my batch. The thing to know is that as soon as I'm ready to process, I click on this box, this message, seven batch items. And this will take me to the batch screen. Now, in Tax Cycle, you can do more than just batch carry forward. You can batch transmit, so batch e-file if you want. And the way that works is it does them uh, one after the other and transmits those files. Um, in the olden days, <laughs> the olden days, I shouldn't say it that way, but I remember back 20 years ago, which isn't as long as some of some people have been in the business, but you used to have to batch them up and transmit them by a separate service. This uses the same e-file service if you decide to transmit that you would use if you were in the software. We just delay the transmissions a little bit by a few seconds so that we don't uh, appear like we're doing a denial of service attack or something like that. You can also batch print and batch print labels, and there's a few other options of return purpose and batch calculate. But I'm going to do a carry for today of these files. In the second column on screen here, these are standard options that you can do when you do any batch, um, batch transaction. So for example, I could export the results to an Excel workbook. And some people like to have this record on hand. Um, there's also I can clear my selections upon completion. I'm not going to do any of those today. In the third column, I have options that relate specifically to carrying forward. So if I'm in June or I'm in the early fall and I want to actually do a bunch of planning returns, we can actually flag all these files that are carried forward as planning returns if I want. And then I can work in them as if they were real, but I can exclude them from the client manager later. Again, I'm just going to carry forward basic, basically. Um, and then there's options of where to put the file and what to do with the file that's carried forward. So I'm going to overwrite the existing file if it's available. Because it's an overwrite, we ask you to confirm. And then it's going to put it in the file, the folder that I have set in options. So if I just start this batch carry forward, uh, Tax Cycle will take a look at the file, convert it, and then put it on the, fi on the file system and put it back in the Client Manager and give me a nice little status there. If I click one of these blue links, I can open the file right away. So that's a simple batch carry forward. Now, um, one of the things we hear about when we first started Tax Cycle is that um, sometimes you get that client in the door who hasn't done tax returns for three years. And any way to make that easier um, is a good thing. So say I have uh, a new client and I create a new return here. And um, I'm using a test version, so I can actually generate a fake social insurance number here. And imagine that Maurice has come in. Um, Maurice Smith came in the door today, and let's just give him a birth date. Um, and he says, I haven't done my tax return in, in three years. Pardon me, I have to call. All right, sorry about that. And so I'm starting my 2018 return and I'm thinking, oh, okay, this is going pretty well. I'm going to do English. He's not, he's widowed. I'm going to do this. And then he comes to me and he says, actually, he's come in the door. And then he comes to me and says, oh, I didn't do last year's return either. And you think, oh, man, you know, I've got this data in here already. Imagine I've done a lot more work than I have. I'm going to have to go back the way things used to work in tax software. You have to go back, do the earliest return and then carry it forward. Um, the way we decided to do this in tax cycle is to allow you a bit of flexibility. So I'm like, oh, man, now i got to go back and do my 2017 return. So what do I do? I can go to the data menu, and I can see this prior year option. Or I can right-click on the return. And what I do is I data menu, and I hit the prior year option, and it says, can't find his prior year return. Well, I know that. Um, so can you create me one? And I click Create. And then now I have my 2017 return. It's going to ask me to save it right away just to help things along. And so now I have Maurice's 2017 return, which is kind of sweet. And the data that was in the 2018 return is also here. And I'm actually going to collapse this and see if this works on my screen to see some things side by side. It's pretty tight. So I may not do this for long. But you can see the data has transferred over. 
Now, now you're working in both of these returns and you're getting some data in and you don't really notice where you're working. You haven't noticed the 2017 watermark and you start adding some data. You know, he's on Main Street. I don't think there's a Main Street in Calgary. Um, and you know, and I've put his phone number in and I've saved this and I'm like, yeah, great. I've got all that data in here, the 20 the return. Oh, wait a minute, it's in the 2017 return, but it's not in the 2018 return. What can I do? Well, and we've got refresh, and this works in any time, even if you haven't created the prior year, but I can actually refresh that carry forward and pull that data in from that 23 retur 2017 return I just created. So watch this, I have no IT, I, um, no information in my 2018 return on the street address, and if I refresh the carry forward, it gives me a warning if I like that, the data comes in. You see now I have an address. And then for fun, you can go back again as if you want. So Maurice is a modern fella. He's got a, a mobile phone number as well. And I'm going to put that in my 2018 return. And then I can refresh the prior year and put it in my 2018 return, 2017 return. So you can see if you have to do multiple years of return and there's information that you need to move back and forth, this is a really quick way to do it. And this is something we care about at Tax Cycle is sharing the information between return types. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna check if it's polling time. I'm gonna do one more thing before polling time. Now, to give you another insight into something a little bit different, when you start to prepare a return in tax cycle, on the left-hand side is where you can see this prepare tab. And it has all the forms in it that you might need um, or that are in the current return. You also have some options to see just the used forms or the data that was carried forward or entered. So this is, helps you narrow down the list. It's a great long list, especially if you're doing Quebec return, it can be, you can have a list of you know 200 odd forms. There is a better way, and it is the F4 key. We call F4 Fast Find, and you'll see some of the principles here that I'm gonna show you in F4 Fast Find across over in the client manager as well. So when we looked at search, and we had the luxury of looking at it for, from a fresh eye and, the, and the, from the time of Google, we thought we needed a search for forms and for data in the client manager that behaved more like what you're used to when you search in your search engine. So you have this blank box and you can enter what you would like to search on. So if I want a T4 form, I just type T4 and I press enter really fast. Let's put some income in this. Imagine he's doing a little bit of work and maybe he's working at Home Depot because he's retired and would like a little extra bit of money. Um, and he's entered some EI premiums. He doesn't need, of course, to do CPP. And we'll take a little bit of income tax off just so that we have a refund there. Now, um, if I go back to my F4 and say I had several T4s, I can search for Home Depot. Did you see I did that? I just As I start to type, it's narrowing down the list. So on slip issuers and things like that, I can search um, for that term rather than for the slip type. And on top of that, I actually get um, I actually get a description or a preview on the right of what's on the slip so I know I'm in the right place. And then you're saying here, well, Elizabeth, what if I want a new slip? As soon as I do T4, it's Home Depot, and now I'm going to have to scroll down and click on this, blah, blah, blah. No, actually, you don't. You hit, I'm going to go back this. We really care about keystrokes and the number that you have to do or the number of clicks you have to do. So let's count it through. F4, one button press. T4, two button press. Here's the clincher on it. If you want to create a new slip from this, control, press down the control and press enter. I don't know if that's three or three and a half clicks and I've got my way into a new form really fast. Now, this also works in other ways. Say I need to do a foreign slip. I start typing foreign. Ah, I get my foreign worksheet. If I keep typing the word and I spell it a little bit better, I get all kinds of forms that relate to foreign slips, uh, foreign income verification sent statement and the foreign tax credit summary, and then of course the T2209 and those related to foreign tax credits. Um, finally, of course I can search a bunch of numbers, I can search line numbers, and I get my preview of the line number. Sorry, that's a box number. 
or line numbers. And I get a preview of the amount that's in the line numbers. So try F4 if you're looking for information in the tax return itself. Okay, it's gonna be down to the wire. I'm gonna do my poll and then I'm gonna pull myself uh, through to the end and hopefully not keep you too long. We are curious as to whether you hire additional help during tax season or whether you're able to get through with your uh, current staffing requirements. And it's okay if you don't prepare returns, you can answer no. You can, as long as you answer the question, it'll count towards your PD credits. We'll just give it a few more seconds. We're up at 76% and I'll wait until we get up to 90. There's a few more of you in the room. 80%. Give you a little bit longer. You want those PD credits. All right, and I'm going to close the poll and I'll show you the results. And 19% of you do hire more people during tax season, so you can make these people more productive if you have a few more of these tips. And let's go back here. Now, um, if you're on a very long form or on a jacket, uh, the 5013 is a good example. And sometimes, you know, if you've ever done a 5013 and you're trying to find the, the field that you want, see how long this slip is? I'm actually gonna make some room on screen. It's a really, really, really long slip. So in tax cycle, we've done something here to allow you to find within the form if you want as well. So if I do control F within the form and say I wanna look for phishing, You'll see it's just like find in form on your web browser. It has highlighted the first item here in green, and then it has found all subsequent items that you can jump down to, the other um, entries that relate to phishing. So that's a little tip if you're on a very long form that you might find useful. And finally, for a navigation, I want to just show you on T1, if, you're, if you think more in terms of the paper and the T1 jackets, you can find your way in um, to the source data as well. So if I'm on line 101 and I see that it's blue, that means it's a calculated field. That means that data is coming from somewhere else. The little um, blue triangle up in the left corner of the field means that you can jump to that. So if I just double click on that, it's going to take me back to the source slip. If I press F6, it'll take me back to the source slip. Now something additional in tax cycle is you'll see these blue links on the descriptions. And it's actually going to tell you, if you hover over it, it'll show you a list of all those slips that relate to that field, including allowing you to create one. And so you can click on it and find your way through. Okay. Now, Maurice has a bunch of review messages, and review messages appear in the sidebar in general. And one of the things we cared about, and said we cared about clicking and keystrokes. So one of the things we cared about was not forcing you to jump around in the return if it was a really easy question to answer. So for example, the citizenship question. There's a review message that says, oh man, you haven't answered the citizenship question. I could potentially double click, go to that field and check yes or no. But I don't have to do all of that if I see this little, this little light bulb appear. If I click on the light bulb, I can answer right here in the sidebar. That makes it easy and a lot less time. Do that again. Um, I can click the little light bulb and answer in the sidebar, and the questions are updated on my info worksheet or wherever that is. For some questions, we actually suggest an answer because it's the most common answer. It was the answer that the taxpayer did in the prior year. So for example, in the principal residence question, I can say answer no to this question and it's done. And you saw how it updated over here. You can even use these actually on the form. You, you can actually come straight and hover on the form and then you have a chance to answer those quick fix messages. This is one of my favorite things that we kind of take for granted because we've always done it this way in tax cycle. But it's amazing the time it saves when you're preparing a tax return. Now, oh, this is a race to the finish a little bit. I wanted to show you something in T2 to finish up our day. And this is going to be a very quick introduction to corporate linking. So including counting clicks, we like to share data. So I'm going to show you just how to link two files in corporate, corporate linking in tax cycle T2. So this is the CGI worksheet, and this is a tax return, um, a corporate tax return that has some associated and related corporations. 
And you would normally list these all on your CGI worksheet. And it's also the place where you can add the information that then flows to Schedule 9 and Schedule 23, like allocating the business limit and things like that. I'm going to make this bigger on screen. Now, um, in some corporate groups, we've noticed that you can have 10 or more corporations and sometimes the year ends don't match up. Um, you would list them all here. And once you have at least the name and you could put the business number, but you don't necessarily have to, and you've got their related tax cycle file, you can create a corporate linking file and then transfer data between the two. So I'm gonna do that. It says, it's suggesting it to me actually, share data between corporate related corporations. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm gonna create a corporate linking file. And that's the CGI link file. And I save it. I've already got one there, but I'm gonna recreate it. And now as soon as I do that, it says, oh, you've listed BNL Pizza as your corporate group information. I have a file for them already. Let's open BNL Pizza's file. So we're gonna do that. And I'm gonna set it up in the same way. And there you go. This is BNL Pizza's corporate group into information file. But you'll notice that I don't have the information it needs from RNL. Is that what I call them? RNL Consulting. But that's quick for me to get. I can import that file I just went and made. It suggested, suggests that I do that. So I'm going to import that file, select it. And now it says that this is the target file. And it brought in the information about RNL Consulting. And if I go back over to RNL Consulting, and it says this is the source of that information. Now, where this starts to come in handy is when you're playing around with things like business limits and allocating that small business limit and other information. So you can see right now that I've got 75% allocated to BNL and 25% allocated to RNL. And if I go over here, you see that the, it's nicely been imported and translated so that it is right for the return that it is in. If I go back to my source file, I can easily change that and have it flow instantly over to the other return. So this is just the basics of making a corporate linking file, but I wanted to point it out so that you know that it's possible and that you can try it out as well with some of your clients. And I'm on number 12. 12 tax cycle tips, made it through. There's one last item that this takes no time at all. I wanted to show you is that when you're in any kind of tax, tax return, the data tab allows you to create other types of returns from the data in this file. So if BNL Pizza needs to create T4 slips for its employees or T5 slips for its investors and dividends, you can do that from here and it will carry the information through. And this is a huge time saver too, because it brings in the, the, you know, the information that you need to get started on that second return. All right, that was fast and easy. I'm going to finish up here just a little bit about tax cycle. Again, if you decide to try tax cycle, please, it's free. We provide sort, free support during your trial. Not sorry, the trial is free. <laughs> Our software is not always free. Um, we provide free te technical support during your trial so we can help you out. And of course, we can carry forward prior year returns from Profile, CanTax, Tax Prep, Visual Tax, and DT Max. And we always back our purchase by a satisfaction guarantee. So if you're not happy, you got to let us know because we'll do everything we can to fix it. Um, right now, if you don't want to miss out on this, is we have our preseason sale on. And I'm actually going to take you to our website before I finish up here. The preseason sale runs to mid-December, so you have some time to take a look at the software, but it's the best deal you're going to get this fall on tax cycle. You'll get, you can save $100 off the main paperless tax suite. And even more than that, we offer um, all through online ordering a 12-month payment plan. So if you want to split your costs over a year and just have it continue like that, you can. And that's a no-fee payment plan when you buy the suite. You can come in through here and try it out if you'd like. If you liked what you saw today, but want to see a few more webinars, please stop by our um, documentation uh, video tutorials page on the website. Or we had our own day long, two day long online conference last week, and we just published um, videos from that conference. And they're all available under the training menu online conference right now. And you can see the first day goes into much more detail about setting options and doc cycle and review and filing and printing, more than I can cover here in my 12 tips. And 
I would like to thank you, Alan, for having me today, and I will transfer the voice back to you, or you can take over and finish up the day. Thank you for letting me uh, talk your ear off for 20, 25 minutes. Um, over to you, Alan. And there we are, the end of another one. Just a little advice on the next one in early November, and I've already told you this, Ward Blatch will be doing a really neat 25 minutes on Microsoft's PI desktop. So that's a wrap. Please remember to answer the questionnaire. Thank you very much for all of you who attended. Thank you, Elizabeth. And that's a wrap.